The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. Well, scripture truly opens up some freedom of living life as our creator designed us to do. And so uh, we want to talk about how do we fall in love from a biblical perspective. And as we started the series, we talked about falling in love is like a seed being planted. Uh, Jesus came and said, you know, if, if a seed just remains a seed, it remains alone. But if it falls to the ground and dies, it bears much fruit. So in contrast to the idea of falling in love as something that you just follow your feelings into whatever form of relationship you find yourself, Jesus' view of love is doing something sacrificial for the betterment of other people and for the world. My daughter is in middle school, and this past week, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it necessarily, but they had this deal where you could order rows, a rose for anybody at school. So the last hour of the day on Valentine's Day, every classroom gets a knock. Someone walks in with a pile of roses and starts handing them to people on the list. And I thought to myself, oh, no. There are going to be so many crying people leaving school on Valentine's Day. Even if you get five, what about the person next to you that got ten? And what about the person who got none? So when we think about uh, falling in love, man, there's, there's a lot of pain out there. The thing's just not going according to plan. Today, specifically, I want to talk about dating. And uh, if you're here and you're married, you're like, oh, great. We don't, we're married. We don't date anymore. Well, that's fine. But specifically, this is to that season of life before marriage that either you were in at one point or you're going to come into contact with people either raising kids who are getting into that age bracket or you're going to have friends that are trying to sort through life as a single person thinking about dating. And I'm hopeful today that this either encourages you if you're in that season or it'll allow you to pass on encouragement to someone who might be. And it'll help hope if you're in a different chapter of life, whether you're not in a dating season or you're married or whatever, I I'm hopeful that it, that it offers you even perspective where you are so this is not take a break if you're not in a dating phase this is wisdom hopefully that applies to all of us but particularly to this phase and someone who you know who may be there interestingly enough think about this now think about kids growing up a hundred years ago somewhere on the farm in north dakota because basically everybody used to live on a farm doesn't happen anymore how many of you grew up on a farm amazing okay almost like half that's changing all the time, but uh, as people, you know, urbanize and society tends to be more suburban and urban, um, less and less people say, I grew up on a farm. But, but back in the day, like before this modern era, pe people would grow up on a farm and there would come an age where you just kind of went, like you woke up in the morning and you were an adult now. You didn't have adolescence. That's a very modern post-World War II reality that we've had for the last 50, 60, 70 years that has never existed in all of human history. They would have child and then some sort of luminality event where you'd go out into the woods and sleep for a couple days and have to kill and eat wolves and then you'd come home and you're a man. Or you'd, you'd be a woman and then you'd... You, but that, the day before, you were a, a child and, and you went from kid to grown up. There was not... What we see now, an extended, meandering path of adolescence. It, it, we take for granted adolescence. Like, ah, this is a season where you're just an adolescent. It never existed before. It starts earlier and earlier. Like, now kids are just growing up fast. 9, 10, 11 sometimes has started to see, be seen as adolescent or pre-adolescent. And... <laughs> And if you're a millennial, I'm not taking a shot at you. I'm just saying this is thrown around out there. Uh, adolescence, every, every year the, the millennial generation goes older. Some people say that's adolescence takes one more year into the future. But I don't think that's true. I think we have some amazing millennials in this church and in this community. But it's often thought of as adolescence no longer goes until you're 16, 17, 18. I remember playing college basketball, and they called it men's basketball. Like, whoa, I'm playing men's basketball. Do they know I'm not a man yet? 
it used to be 18 was seen as a man. And I think if you talk to most 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds, they still think of themselves oftentimes as a kid. Adolescence often now is seen as something that continues into your late 20s, possibly your early 30s. Oftentimes people don't start families until their mid 30s. And so we have an extending period from 11 all the way till say 30 ish of whatever this is, this this in between reality that never used to exist. Here's why that's so significant when it comes to relationships. It used to be that you went from single to married. Like you really didn't spend a lot of time in between. That's not to say that you didn't maybe have a period where you're like my grandma and grandpa, they, they worked for a long time to be able to afford to be married. So they kind of knew they were getting married. They kind of thought of themselves as married, but they were they were dating kind of, but really just single until they could earn enough money to get married. So they went from basically single to a married couple, even though there was some time in there they needed to work. Um, if you look at biblical categories, they start to make more sense. When you think of this is how 99% of human history thought of relationships. You're single or you get married. <laughs> so you, you read Bible passages that start to make more sense. You see Genesis chapter 2, when they start describing re relationships and families, it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and go through a period of 19 years of bachelorhood. No. It just says, and be joined to his wife. You, you go from being a child in your parents' home to you, actually the woman would move in with the husband at her, his parents' house. They'd build another room on their shack, and they'd, they'd move in. Man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That one flesh union takes place as you go from child to adult, single to married. You become one with a person that God has created uniquely to complement you physically, sexually, emotionally, spiritually. That, that, that's the process of of single to marriage from this classic traditional biblical point of view. Very foreign to how we think of it today. Other places in the scripture echo this, B but because of the tem temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. So it's like, okay, if, if you're now becoming an adult and you want to be able to be physically connected to someone, then the job is get married and enjoy that gift. Otherwise, there's 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 really no options. And it's like, well, of course, there's lots of other options today. People get, you know, are physical in all kinds of other relationships. But biblically, it's like you go from single to, to married. That's, that's that's how you do it. So um, this kind of mirrors the track of adolescence today is that we w instead of that single to married, simple twofold categories that people grew up with for human history. Now we have um uh, an extended episode of The Bachelor. <laughs> and I, I, anybody watch The Bachelor, Bachelorette? No shame if you do, no shame if you do. I hadn't, it's okay. Don't, you can raise that loud and proud. It's okay if you do. I, I, I watched the episode. It's, it's, it's interesting. And I, I know a lot of people who watch it. But I was like, interesting perspective. Like, how many different women do you need to get into a hot tub with to figure out who's for you? <laughs> like, how, I, like, that never occurred to me when I was dating. Like, let's just do a succession of hot tub parties, one-on-one -on -one hot tub parties, and eventually the, the cream will rise to the, rise to the surface and I'll, I'll find the right one. I, like, th th nowadays, uh, there's this extended period in which you either are seen as, the, I play the field, I, I have fun, I simply get to know people romantically, as friends, whatever, and eventually I will cross out of this swamp, this meandering adolescent swamp of singleness that now is not singleness, but it's not marriage, and eventually I'll just know that it's time to get married, but I have no idea when, if, and how that'll happen. I'm just, I'm just somewhere in here right now, and to talk, I talk to a lot of women who feel called over here, to, like, I feel called to marriage, and they are so frustrated because they end up dating guys who just feel called to the weird middle forever. They're like, I want, I want to move out of this phase, and I, I meet so many people who just, that's what they feel like life is, and that's all they see. And this new category of modern human history of the extended adolescence in dating causes a lot of pain. 
I'm not saying get married when you turn 14. I, you know what? Unless you're from, uh, you know, a different era, that just doesn't work nowadays. But I'm not sure this does either. So what this creates is a tension. It creates a tension when our culture of extended adolescence collides with a biblical vision for marriage, sex, and singleness. It's just like, it's a stark contrast. It creates a stark tension. And, and this creates shame. And it also creates an impulse to reject the biblical vision for being too narrow or even hateful. And so when you talk about sure, men and women are created with a complementary physicality, spirituality that God is calling some to um, become one flesh through marriage and uh, to kind of, uh, as quickly as you can, not just pitch a tent and live in this barren wasteland of extended adolescence, but really ask, where is God calling me? How is he calling me to invest? And if it's toward marriage, I'm going to move in that direction with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and trusted friends. That, that vision for purity of lifestyle and focus of relationships is so different from where most of our experiences are that there's almost no way to talk about it without the shame exploding through the roof. And, and, and when I, wha- I've, ha- I've been in churches where we, we talk about this and then we have to schedule a session afterward for people to yell at the pastor <laughs> <laughs> because they're so angry that, w- that it's hateful or because it's, it's not inclusive of all different views of relationships and life and what about my son, what about my daughter, what about this woman that I'm living with and it doesn't correspond to what you're saying God says. I'm like, look, our job is to tell the truth as lovingly as we can. And sometimes when guilt or shame emerge, it isn't necessarily proof that God is wrong or that the Bible is wrong, but that we have some soul searching to do that ultimately, in the end, could be really, really good for us. Now, there's two things that we can do when we feel that tension or that shame emerge as we compare where we are as a culture with the biblical view and and it's interesting to watch different churches take different perspectives on this. Um, I found a blog uh, called the Bookish Bear blog. It's an article that was going around the Internet, and it was a fascinating article written by a gay man who said a lot of churches tried to be inclusive of, peop- of, of, of gays and lesbians by saying you're welcome here. And at the same time, they still had value of, of, of two-person relationships, committed marriage, whatever. And he says, the, he said here is why gay people don't go to your churches. Here is why people are actually not coming to your church just because you hang a welcome banner in front of it. And he says, look, um, very few churches have the conceptual, pastoral, theological space necessary to support the non-monogamous, polyamorous, BDSM-aligned relationships in order to explore the significance of non-platonic, non-romantic relationships. So this author's point was you haven't gone far enough. The biblical view of relationships is so unbelievably narrow that you actually need to expand it to any kind of relationship should be celebrated and accepted which most churches just are able and willing to do. And by the way, do me a little word to the wise. Don't Google, what is BDSM? <laughs> You're going to end up with something on your computer you don't want. Just word to the wise. It just doesn't go well. Anyway, but I, did, I, I had to look up some of these. I'm like, I'm, I think I know what they mean. I'm not sure. Whoa, I wish I hadn't Googled that. Okay. There's a pastor named Nadia Bolt Weber who wrote a book called Shameless. And her, in her view, as a pastor, she says, our, our job as Christians should be to eliminate shame by, n- by saying any kind of consensual relationship is good. As long as you're not violating someone, it's good. And by talking about scripture passages that say God actually calls us to live in this way and say no to this and say yes to this, she says that creates shame, and shame is the problem. So don't create shame, simply affirm so we have one way of dealing with this cultural tension that we have when we look at the scripture's view of marriage, sexuality, and relationships, and we look at our culture and we see a vast gap. One way of dealing with that tension is to say, look, we need to bridge the gaps. We need to defi- just purely being affirming of whatever people want to do. We need to affirm it. Here, here's the problem, though. I get a call from a couple at 7.30 at night who's decided to have an open marriage contract, and they want to know if I'm okay with that. We both feel called to relationships outside of our marriage, but want to stay married. Am I supposed to affirm that just because no one's getting married? Maybe except their children? I mean, of course not. 
problem with this is it just doesn't work. There's too many variations in the human condition that you end up just saying yes to sex that's just plain ridiculous. It doesn't work to deal with shame by just pretending that everything's okay. It just doesn't work. If it worked, we'd be doing it, and it would work. There's two options. One is to, to kind of cr- adopt self-justifying values where we just create a system where everything's okay, or, and this is the or that I hope we connect with today, to embrace our creator's guidance and his forgiveness. Here's where the church is totally screwed up over history. We, ab- we adopt the creator's guidance for relationships, but we have not just as passionately claimed his forgiveness for when we don't live up to them and none of us do. And so people hear the church, people hear Christians saying, that's wrong, that's a sin. Look at my bumper sticker, look at the sign I'm holding up, listen to this angry sermon I'm giving. But we don't say, but none of us live up to the glory of God. None of us can fully achieve this in our relationships. And so while we're called to strain in the direction, we're also called to say, but God is so good and God is so gracious that he plans on us screwing up more than we do and forgiving us over and over and over again. So if you don't live up to this vision, guess what? God expects that, and grace is here for you. Grace is here when your relationship doesn't look like it should. Grace is here when your sexuality doesn't conform to the biblical picture of marriage. Grace is there. God wants to forgive. God wants to guide. God wants to point us towards Christ and then say, look, You are not ostracized if you struggle to live up to this. God wants to welcome you home, guide you, bless you, and direct you. Forgiveness is right up there as important as God's guidance. God's guidance never exists without his forgiveness. And as a church, we have to claim grace as we claim standards, or people just hear hatred. That's all they hear. And we just feel crappy about ourselves. So with all that in mind, with Look, we're not, as a a surprise church, we're not going to ditch Scripture's guidance for marriage, love, life, sexuality, relationships. We're not going to ditch it because we assume our Creator knows better than we do. We assume that His vision corresponds to what's best for us. We trust Him, but we will never do so letting go of grace. We will never do so without saying, look, when people fail, and all of us will, we champion the surprising grace of a God who would rather die than hold our sins against us. Okay? With that in mind, here's six quick tips for dating. This is for you if you're, if you're thinking about that or you're in that stage. It's also for someone that you're trying to raise who's in that uh, chapter of their uh, childhood, adolescence, adult life. It's also for friends that just are sorting out, what do I do in this culture of extended adolescence? Six quick things. Number one, um, date with a full heart for marriage. Date with a full heart for marriage. Here's what I mean by that. Um, we want to challenge people to meet their needs through Jesus and not through dating. Anybody I talk to who is really, really feeling like they need somebody in their life to feel okay, it usually is not a recipe for a happy, healthy relationship, and that person feels the need to push away from them early and often. It just doesn't work. They're looking for something in a person that they can only get fulfilled with God and non-romantic relationships that can support them as good friends can. So date when you feel called to share the fullness that God has given you through marriage. Now, if you're a middle schooler, like I'm not saying get married as soon as you can. I'm saying... Um, when God is calling us to romantically engage in dating relationships, it means that there's something that he has done in my heart that's prepared me to have something to share. And as I'm taking steps into that relationship, I'm open to doing that to the extent that it's age-appropriate and it's driven towards someday I'm going to be married if I'm called to date, and I want to prepare myself and this person to be married, which we'll talk about more in a minute. So God wants us to date with a full heart, not a heart that needs to be full by another person. And it's surprised. We give away these prayer books every day. On your way out, grab a prayer journal, grab a reset prayer book. Um, We have DNA groups and missional communities that are all designed to help people fill their tanks, fill their hearts with the love of God through Jesus and people that just want to love on them and receive love from them. But it's a totally just a a pure way of growing as a a human being that will prepare you to pour into other relationships. Uh, So date with a full heart if you're going to date, not an empty one, not a half full one. Also, this is probably one of my favorite ones to tell, especially teenagers, but people of any age need to hear this one. De-isolate dating. De-isolate dating. Uh, If you think of the image of like the dark basement room with the couch and Netflix in front of a a, a widescreen TV, 
Like that is some, some people's view of when you're dating, you need a couch, you need Netflix, and all the pressure that goes along with being in a dark basement by yourself, and that's how you get to know a person. Like, eh, not good. Oh, not well, good. she's dating. Um, oh, oh. Dating brains need logical perspective. I said to her, you know what, I, I noticed that you're dating so-and-so, and the more time we spend together, I noticed this temper problem that he has. I noticed that every time we get together, he just, he really, really drinks too much. And he doesn't treat you well. Have you noticed that? Yeah, but, but it's just, it's just, he works hard and whatever. I'm like, no, wait, wait, wait. you got to think about this. I know it feels good to have someone in your life, but I want to, I want to challenge you to think about it. When you're tempted to just feel. So important. De-isolate your dating. Third, put Jesus first. I probably should have put this one first, right? Uh, never put a partner above God and healthy boundaries. I see this so often where someone says, okay, I got this date. Yeah, he won't go to church with me or she won't like talk, you know, she won't share my faith, but she's awesome. And I think that'll change over time. Mm, right, right, right. Dating to change someone, super idea. Almost as effective as sarcasm, right? <laughs> uh Trust that the person that you're dating is not going to change because they're dating you. And if they do change because they're dating you, they're probably just going to change for a little while and go back to the norm. So um, people, people oftentimes will say, look, I, I, I can't – I have to disengage from my family or friends. Or in this case, I have to dis disengage from my church community because the person I'm dating doesn't feel comfortable with that. Now, think of what you're giving up. What else are you willing to give up if you're willing to sacrifice your faith to be with a person? And should you want to really be with someone who says, look, I know your faith is important to you, but you're willing to let that go for me because it's not, I don't share it. What do you, if you're willing to give up your faith, you're pretty much going to give up everything else that matters to you. And I know that oftentimes we think that's loving, isn't it? It's isn't like doesn't even the Bible tell us to sacrifice? Like I'm sacrificing, right? I'm sacrificing my commitment to faith and church and spiritual friendships to be with this person. I'm I'm sacrificing. Isn't that good? There's a difference between sacrificing for love of another person and sacrificing for the love of self. And it's this sounds backwards. It's incredibly selfish. To abandon your faith to be with someone because you want the feeling of companionship so bad. It is incredibly selfish. It's not selfless. Selfless is, look, I want the best for you. I want, I want love and joy for you. And it's, if I give away everything about myself so that I have nothing left, I can't love you at all. I am a clone for you. That's not loving at all best way I can love you is be true to who God made me to be, try to live out of my deepest convictions and carry them into our relationship so that I'm not just stuck trying to please you or placate you to keep you with me because I like the feeling I get with you. It's incredibly selfish to abandon and sacrifice your faith for another person. It's not loving. Not at all. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things that you want in life are going to be given to you as well. Sometimes we say, I, I need to put the kingdom second and get this thing worked out. And then we find that we're just hollow once we've given away our very selves. Seek first God's kingdom, and these other things are going to work out, Jesus says. Um, fourth, go beyond physical. Premature physical intimacy, and this is really, really important, especially for dating adults, obviously for teens as well, but oftentimes... I talk to people who say, um, look, I have to sleep around to date. I just, that's what people do nowadays. I'm like, do they? Or is it just the people you're dating? I don't know if that's true. Premature physical intimacy undermines the, the building of spiritual and emotional intimacy. This goes along with the impulse-driven nature of dating. Uh, oftentimes we say, look, we have to be physical when we're dating. Number one, because that's, that's what people want when they're dating. And if you don't do that, then you'll never date anybody. And you'll be alone for the rest of your life. But that goes along with kind of abandoning your convictions to be with somebody. But even more importantly, here's, here's why I recommend um, going beyond the physical, not, not letting the sexual, romantic, intimate stuff play a role sorely in a relationship. 
because you tend to avoid deepening other critical areas that you're going to need later. It, God says reserve se sex for marriage not because he wants us to be really, really bored until we get married. He wants us to cultivate other deeper forms of intimacy that if we don't have them, our marriages won't last. He wants the best for us. And when you're with someone, the, 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 the intense fireworks of premature sensuality in the relationship distract us from saying, how can I bond emotionally with this person? How can I develop physical, or, or excuse me, emotional and spiritual intimacy with this person that is going to be paramount down the road? It tends to undercut that. Now, some couples can recover. Like when I, when I marry couples and they're living together, I'm like, look, you guys had prioritized physicality in a relationship earlier than you should have. Fine, okay. So you're going to have to work hard to cultivate some things that are not developed as they could be if you'd have prioritized those first. We can do that. We can work with that. I'm not trying to shame you. I'm trying to guide you with grace. Okay. But if you're starting fresh and you're trying to find the best way to go, I always say, if you remove physicality from your relationship and your relationship disappears, it's probably not going to last. So why not do that while you're dating to see if there's actually a relationship beyond physical urges there that just sustain your relationship because of Kool-Aid and fireworks. See if the emotional intimacy can sustain you. See if s cultivating spiritual intimacy can sustain you. And if that isn't enough, if that's not going to last, I guarantee you, you want to know that before you get married rather than after. So go beyond the physical to see if there's actually a relationship there that's going to sustain your marriage down the road with the person. Fifth, almost done. I'm going to invite the band back up as I conclude here. Dating is practice. This is not the end game. Dating is actually practice for people who feel called to marriage. That's what I believe. Um, if you're a teenager feeling called, that someday I want to have a family, great. If you're 30, then I'm, I'm looking for that special person, great. Dating provides a chance to respect, serve, care for, and honor a person which prepares both of you for marriage. And I had to add this probably to somebody else. The odds of you being married to the person that you start dating are probably pretty low, just if you look at statistics, and that's okay. So imagine the person that you're dating, imagine five years down the line you meet at a park, and you look at that person, and they're with their spouse and their kids, and you're with your spouse and your kids, and you get to look at that person and say, how good a job did I do preparing that person for that call to that kingdom? Are you going to walk away proud? thankful that you invested in them and cared for them and, and showed them what it looks like to be treated with dignity and respect? Or are you going to say, gosh, I was selfish in that chapter of my life, and I feel really bad about that. I hope it didn't affect their family life too much. One of the greatest definitions of love I heard is love does not say, what can I get from this person? Love doesn't say, how can this person improve my life? Love doesn't say, um, I love how I feel with this person, and so I want to be with this person because of, of the joy that they bring me. Love says, true love, if you truly fall in love with someone, you look at that person and say, how can I help that person live up to their God-given potential? If you're called to date somebody, you are called to, for a season of life, a probably short season, maybe extended, possibly for the rest of your life, but, but probably not, statistically speaking. For this season of my life, do I feel called to help that person live up to their potential? Do you notice how that does not assume that I'm trying to use that person to be okay? It assumes that I found a way of being okay with other friendships and with Jesus so that I don't need that person. I get invest in that person. I have something to share and love to share with that person to prepare them for the future that God has for them, to live up to their potential, whether I'm a part of that equation or not. If you truly love someone, that is what you say. And lastly, I just want to remind us all this. You are whole in, you are whole in Jesus. Maybe you're married and your marriage is feeling fractured or feeling like you've just hit a plateau or a decline. Maybe you're single, and it's, it's right where you want to be. Maybe you are single, and it's the last place you want to be. And you look at friends and their Facebook posts, and it just makes you feel like half a person. 
when Jesus came into the world, he lived the life of a single man who went from person to person and person and was led by the question, how can I love this person most by putting an investment into them of helping them live up to their God-given potential? How can I do that with this person? And when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't see half a person. He doesn't see a person that really just needs somebody else to be okay. He doesn't see a person that isn't quite living up to his standards and so, gosh, you know what, um, maybe down the road you'll be good enough for him. He accepts you totally and completely as you are. He does not want you trying to find acceptance in other people to be okay. He wants you to accept his joy in you so that you can share that joy with others. The answer isn't found by just chucking the biblical standards and vision and guidance for marriage, sexuality, singleness. It's not, there's no hope there. There's no joy there. There's only more selfishness there. And when you feel shame, when you feel like you disappointed yourself or others or God, there's plenty of grace. This is a church where we talk about grace all the time. There's forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness when we fall short of God's standards and of God's guidance. And you know what? You are 100% accepted by God in your fallenness, in your imperfection. You are whole even though you aren't perfect. And the more you embrace that fact, the more you'll be able to invest in someone else who is also not perfect, who is also not going to be the, the perfect cookie cutter of the perfect person. And what your job is is not to find that perfect person that fulfills you, but to say, I've been fulfilled by the one perfect person that's ever lived. His name is Jesus. Now I get to live out the victory of Christ of that beautiful, perfect person living through me and helping other people live up to their you stand and pray with me as God leads us to relate to people that way in all of our lives and relationships. Heavenly Father, whether it's in our parenting, whether it's in our marriages, whether it's in our friendships, whether it's in our school or work relationships or sports and, uh, relationships, Father, we pray for the power and the capacity to accept your complete grace in our lives the perfection of Jesus Christ applied to imperfect people like us so that when we look at people around us, we're not trying to fill those voids and scars that we've accumulated through our own decisions or through the actions of others. We have been forgiven, freed, and healed through the blood of Jesus Christ so that we can pour into other people to help them live up to their potential. God, help our singles to learn how to do that and prepare them to be married someday by that act. Prepare them to also invest in others for their betterment. And I pray that when someone ends up dating someone from Surprise Church, they say, wow, I didn't know there were people like that out there. They just seem to have a wholeness about them without needing something from me. I just, I've never been loved like that before. I've never been treated like that before. And then may they learn that behind the scenes, the ultimate cause of that love is nothing other than Jesus Christ crucified resurrected. Teach us how to live with that love. In Jesus' name, all God's saints said, amen. Come forward and receive communion as we sing this last song. We'll have people next to the curtain. They would love to pray for anything in your life or anyone in your life. God bless you this week. Let's love like Jesus.